So welcome to our today's conversation. Um, Sir, could you do us a little introduction? Uh, tell us about, because we know you have uh, an amazing talent there. You have people like from Pixar and all over. So a little intro would be nice. Sure. Um, well, I'll tell you first a little bit about Arcturus. Um, Arcturus created Holosuite. It's uh, the world's first post-production platform for editing and distributing volumetric video. Um, really at the forefront of uh, the next frontier of content as it shifts towards immersive realities. Um, you know, you can think of us a bit of a, we're, we're a bit of a linchpin by combining both the editing of volumetric video and the ultimately ultimate delivery of volumetric video to users via streaming. Um, you know, Arcturus kind of like benefits from both those places not just uh, uh, benefiting from the disruption that volumetric video introduces to the market at all, but being in a place to actually drive that disruption. And uh, uh, you know, we started the journey in 2016. Um, volumetric capture systems were just in their infancy. Our founders saw the future need for this professional grade post-production and distribution tools um, designed really from the ground up for volumetric video. And, and yes, you're right. Uh, we do have some fantastic talent as our founders. And uh, so I'll just share just a tiny bit about them um, to kind of paint maybe a more cohesive picture as to why uh, this particular group is so well suited for this. First, I'll start with our chief product officer, who's Ewan Johnson. Um, he has 20 years of experience building pipelines for uh, animation. And he did that from at Pixar as one of the first uh, 10 or 12 employees uh, at Pixar. And then he went on to do it for another 10 years at DreamWorks. So if you've seen an animated movie in the last 20 years or so, Ewan's hands are all over it. So he's intimately familiar with like the tools that creators need. Um, our chief technical officer, Devin Horseman, has years of experience with his whole engineering team of bringing research to market. Uh, and that's critical with something that's still so nascent like volumetric video. You know, the, they're scouring white papers, building things on their own, truly deep dives into tech, math, uh, and understanding everything that's happening. And so he, he's, he and his team are ideal for kind of like that heavy industrial strength background. And then Kamal Mistry, our chief executive, uh, has 20 years of product management experience. Um, who also started at Pixar, but went on to really make some moves at Autodesk uh, and then Netflix and Uber ATG, where you know he oversaw all aspects of uh, really cutting edge AI and um, uh, uh, again, heavy math uh, activities that drove a lot of those initiatives at really big companies. Uh, and, and lastly, I guess me, um, I'm not one of the founders. I came on like a year after uh, Arcturus founded, but I'm responsible for marketing and business development. Uh, personally, I've got ten, over 10 years of experience at PR on the ad agency side. Uh, and then I've got another 10 years uh, here in Los Angeles working at Sony Studios and other production companies, a variety of media tech startups. Um, and specifically for me, like I've always been interested and in really forward looking on the towards the next big tech thing, um, how it'll be used for content creation from entertainment to marketing to training, uh, et cetera. Why volumetric videos? Like what is so interesting about them? What, why is there so much research and people are going into this and people are investing obviously into these kind of products? If you could give us like a little bit more about the market, where they are used and where they're gonna be used like in the next couple of years, it would be interesting to kind of have an understanding. Of course. Um, and uh, and just kind of like to intro the, the, the volumetric video is just some basics around volumetric video. Um, it's recording video in three dimensions, right? You're capturing that object uh, three dimensionally in real time and it's photo real. Uh, so it's not a CG avatar, it is an actual person captured with an array of cameras that surround them that create a 3D uh, image of that person, right? Um, so th they're a natural fit for any spatial experience like in augmented or virtual reality. Um, so while it's natural for that, some of the other use cases that we're starting to see now uh, include a 2D possibilities. 
um, particularly these volumetric captures being integrated into virtual productions using real-time camera tracking, or they can be placed into 2D compositions. Um, they act as a base for VFX processing or, uh, or even letting you adjust that performance, um, that physical performance in post-production. So, so yes, volumetric video is kind of like this um, really amazing new technology that's being used in a variety of ways. Um, the ways that we've seen it most recently has been, you know, we've seen uh, some live sports uh, integrating volumetric videos into their captures, like some of those really cool shots you may recall from, uh, from football games, from basketball, from hockey. Uh, there are some stadiums that have been wired to, to show this. So they're using that now. Soccer, rugby, um, a variety of sports using that now. Um, also as a kind of interactive digital human assistance. Um, so e-commerce activations where people can view their products in 3D, kind of ask questions, go back and forth. Social media marketing campaigns, we've seen like Snoop Dogg have a volumetric capture of himself promoting his wine, right? And he's standing there answering questions next to his own bottle of wine. Um, these are just fun, uh, clever use of the technology uh, to uh, really kind of start opening up the possibilities of what volumetric video has to offer. Um, you know, this yeah, this past year has been really hard uh, for for marketing companies because they can't do any in-person activations, right? So how, how do they do that now? Well, some companies like Samsung um, turned to volumetric uh, and to deliver something really special. Like we worked with them to create volume, volumetric copies of the Korean boy band BTS. And we used those volumetric copies of the boys as a way to kind of provide that in-person feel that they weren't able to do at a live event to their consumers. And as you might imagine, it was a smash hit, um, you know, with their cult-like fans. I'm, I'm just wondering, do you see this as a, like a substitute for traditional videos and like all the years in the future, we're gonna be like volumetric and we're gonna turn them around and see the details and so on and so forth. Or is it more like a, like a supplementary thing and that it kind of adds to like the usual way that we're accustomed to watch TV or enjoy video and so on? You know, I love that question, Kirill, because it's, it, it, it's posing a very interesting dynamic for us, right? We see the world in three dimensions uh, and we've been taught over, how, you know, however many years television's been around, that we should that we can see things in 2D, right? That we can see them flat and that's okay with us. But the fact of the matter is that we see things in 3D and I think that we prefer to see them in 3D. They look better, they look more natural, uh, gives us an opportunity to kind of look at them from other angles and kind of pursue them from uh, a different point of view. And I think that's, that will replace 2D in time. I don't think that's immediate. I don't think that's going to happen like in the next couple of years. Certainly not. No. And for now, it will be like you said, it will supplement everything in 2D. Um, you know, the near future gaming, um, movies, marketing, all of those disrupted by integrations of volumetric video content. Absolutely. You know, imagine like a photo real version of Pokemon Go. I think that we'll see within the next year or two. So what about the situation in the current market right so there are a lot of ways that you can kind of see 3d model in um in a web space right so we have sketchfab i think we have marmoset and there's like a, a bunch of other tools available so how is your tool different and um what is kind of like under this visual layer that we see so is there a 3D model there? Is there like a streaming tag there? So how does it actually work? Sure. I mean, there's um, there's a couple pieces. Uh, so Hollow Hollow Suite consists of two products, um, Hollow Edit uh, and Hollow Stream, uh, currently, right? So you could think of us as like um, we're develop Hollow Suite will contain a whole set of tools as we continue growing and evolving and developing more and more tools, but currently it contains those two. Hollow Edit is like um, a combination of Final Cut and After Effects, um, but just for volumetric video. Because volumetric video is 3D, 
um, people that are familiar with 3D animation tools are, are you know, quicker to grasp the concepts that HollowEdit provides. Because even though it's just like a nonlinear editor, you're still able to spin around a character, see it in three dimensions, look at it from any angle. So it adds an extra layer of complexity to when you're working with that kind of footage. It's very uh, heavy, you know, the, the file sizes are huge. Uh, what you're working with is co complicated. And we've tried to simplify that as much as possible. So some elements of our tools are automated uh, in order to kind of strip away the kind of menial tasks of, let's say, fixing things frame by frame, um, or instead you can just apply a fix across an entire set of frames, uh, saving you a tremendous amount of time, um, but also uh, giving you tools that allow you to blend sequences together. Because to date, when people have been in volumetric capture stages, they think that they're tied to just the one take that they have from the stage. But we're offering a set of tools that allow you to start blending those takes and matching frames so that you're not limited to just that one take. Now you can start adding takes and building out long sequences. So uh, you're able to kind of really evolve that experience into something much more magical. Um, so hollow edit is a combination of all those things. Uh, again, you know, thinking of it as like final cut where you're kind of putting together mm -hmm. that entire sequence after effects, giving you the tools to work in something in 3d, um, uh, maybe Maya would be a better, you know, comparison there, but like that concept, right. Uh, we're going to compress those files and prepare those for delivery. And that's when hollow stream steps into the equation and hollow stream is that delivery tool special for distribution. We are the only adaptive streaming solution on the market right now. So just like Netflix or Amazon Video, you know, depending on what your internet connection is and what your device is, you're going to get served up the highest quality that you can view at that particular time. We're doing the same thing with volumetric video um, and uh, truly making that experience kind of like unique uh, in comparison to what others are doing with uh, streaming nowadays. So no, I'm just kind of kind of chat on the, the next question that I have kind of connected with that. So it says on your website that it's basically uh, like a capture agnostic tool, meaning that uh, you can get the data from everywhere. Uh, it would be nice if you could kind of explain that all a bit because currently on the market, more and more solutions appear that allow you to capture data and uh, animation in particular, right? So I'm interested, to, and those are like all different quality. Some of them are like very high res. Some of them are like low. So yes, uh, Hollow Edit is uh, intentionally capture agnostic. Um, we are able to ingest uh, files from, frankly, any uh, uh, capture system in the world uh, and work with them uh, within Hollow Edit. Uh, we are uh, primarily we are focused on working with mesh based files and while there are systems that initially capture in point cloud all of them are able to convert in some way shape or form into mesh uh, and that's when we step into the process so uh, systems uh, like 40 views microsoft um, intel's uh, uh, then working our way through the list of Tedavi and Evercoast, uh, EFEV, DepthKit, uh, all of the kind of systems that are out there all have, all, all are outputting some type of mesh. And that mesh is then able to be ingested into HollowEdit. We have intentionally remained capture agnostic, much like, uh, you know, the comparison here is easy to make to, to, to film and editing. Uh, I don't care what camera you use to capture your film. Um, you're you're going to want to edit that film somehow. We give you the tools to edit that film. Could you talk a little bit about the edit part? I think it's like one of the big chunks of what you're offering. And there are attempts to do this in a lot of different software. Like there's standards like Maya and all the other stuff. The, you have editing tools in Unreal Engine, in Unity where you can basically build a film like in the in the engine and you can do whatever you can play around with camera you can do different angles you can do cuts and it it kind of gives you a lot of new tools that you don't really have with kind of traditional 
like film or like a, a digital picture that you get. So how does your tool help to kind of open up new ways to communicate with the audience and to bring up new interesting ways to show the content? Well, uh, one of the things that I saw very early on uh, as a demo uh, within Arcturus was the ability to manipulate uh, performance, the physical performance of a capture in post-production. And that blew my mind. Uh, because now what we're essentially able to do is there's no need for a reshoot if there was just a physical thing that needs to be different. Uh, we can just make that physical change uh, in post-production. That changes a lot of things. Um, and, and I think to your, your broader question about like editing in general and how is it different from like Maya or Unity or Unreal, um, you know, Maya, Maya was designed, uh, it was not designed for volumetric video. Uh, and it is quite challenging to work with volumetric video in Maya uh, directly. Um, we've designed a set of plugins that make it easy, uh, but those plugins are crucial to make that experience, uh, you know, much easier and simpler to work with. Um, so those those kinds of steps along the way are what changes uh, our editing tools. And I think also thinking about our tools as a nonlinear editor that has these other 3D elements added to it, the ability to fix um, digital artifacts, to clean the textures, to um, rearrange the geometry or fix the geometry that is in the mesh. Uh, those things are unique to, um, uh, to, to hollow edit uh, that are simply you know, lifesavers when you're working with 30 frames per second, or in some cases, 60 frames per second coming out of these capture stages. So cleaning things and working things frame by frame are simply not tenable uh, uh, for, for the long term. Um, now, I was talking about skeletonization and how we're able to manipulate a physical performance in post-production. It's one of the super most exciting things about volumetric video to me. Um, changing that physical performance to match, let's say, a CG object that you're going to drop into Unity or Unreal, and you want your character to respond to it. You want them to look at it. You want them to point at it. Whatever it is you want them to do. You want them to get in it. You want them to jump off it, whatever it might be. You're going to need those tools to kind of match the performance to the object. Do those little tweaks. Do those little adjustments so that it looks right. So we're giving you those tools to do that and bake them into a final performance that you'll then you know, bring into a game engine for the actual, uh, uh, actual experience that you're building. But there's one other level that is very exciting with Hollow Edit, and that's the ability to make those changes of, those phys of that physical performance be in uh, reply to what the viewer themselves is doing. So what, what, what do I mean by that? The character can turn and look at the viewer. If the viewer moves, the character will turn and continue to follow them. The character can hand the viewer something. The viewer can receive it and they can hand it back. So it makes that experience so much more immersive because you're literally, literally this time, interacting with that volumetric character. Um, and that is something that we have not seen very much of in uh, volumetric video uh, in a, on a grand scale yet, but we will, um, and our tools are driving that. So it's, an, it's a very interesting take on the way we interact with kind of media in general, right? Be because before film and TV, in the majority of cases, if you don't include the experiments that uh, Netflix was making like most recently, um, it was like a passive experience mostly, right? So you were just sitting there and enjoying the film and then you, you don't really, really have any ways to connect or communicate with the characters and so on. So this kind of brings a new way to enjoy the film or any kind of content that you have. So, and that kind of brings up my next question. So who do you think are your main clients? And if you had some experiences with clients already, like, who do you think enjoyed it more? Who got like the most out of it? Because I see a lot of ways that you can implement this in marketing and films and ads and games and so on, but it would be nice to kind of 
Kira, what do your clients say? Who are your clients and where do you think, where do you work like with this? So yes, the, the majority of our things have been um, marketing driven in some way, shape or form. Um, but they could be, they have been entertainment experiences, um, like the Madonna holograms we did for the Billboard Music Awards a couple of years ago. So absolutely, I can imagine, you know, a new world of concerts, of virtual concerts, where the performer is a hologram that responds to you in your own living room, that turns to you, that looks at you, that asks you, what song do you want to hear next and performs that. Um, so the customization of these kinds of characters is, is this next realm of uh, volumetric video. Um, the, you know, uh, uh, there have been some interesting experiences. Uh, for example, um, I'm thinking specifically about the, uh, the, the Shoah Foundation working with StoryFile to create uh, captures of Holocaust survivors. And they filmed them, you know, uh, in 360, kind of made them holograms. And they're able to respond in real time to questions posed by the audience, even though they're not there. So the technology for these things exists. Now it's a matter of putting them together and applying them to the right use cases that the clients are interested in. You know, uh, a hotel concierge that uh, doesn't have to be a real person anymore. A, um, an insurance executive, a, um, a cooking instructor, uh, certainly a doctor, a nurse. Yeah, like from all your experiences and the examples, it seems like that uh, this whole COVID thing, it actually kind of helped you a little bit to <laughs> promote this idea in the, the general public, right? Before, before everybody thought, I mean, not your tech, but like in, in general, this kind of automatic thing and the holograms and all that stuff, it kind of felt like a gimmick to a lot of people. Uh, but right now, it seems like it's like a viable thing to, you know, cut down on the risk or to add some more opportunities to where you never actually saw opportunities before. Absolutely. Um, and I think, uh, you know, kudos to Balenciaga, uh, the fashion brand that in the fall, released a, a kind of a gamified version of their runway show um, that was all volumetric. I mean, it was genius. Uh, I'm certain it wasn't inexpensive, but I bet it was a whole lot less than them actually doing a runway show. Yeah, I think like if you talk about fashion, this is one of the great examples where this kind of tech could be used, right? Because a lot of those companies are using 3D scans already on their stores or in their ads and so on. So I think this would be like the next step for them to kind of move forward and so on. So I guess to wrap up, I would like to ask you, how do you see just the visual tech world change in the next, let's say like five, 10 years? So what do you think are gonna be like the major technologies driving us forward? Are we going to see more streaming tech? You know, is the videos going to be more interactive? Are there going to be maybe new formats that you're gonna enjoy in VR or AR? So what, what from your position, like from your company's position, so what do you think are like the next couple of big things that would be very interesting for our viewers? Well, I, I certainly think that we will see a, a, a photo real version of a Pokemon Go kind of large scale game. And I think it's going to usher in a new type of entertainment. And that will be very interesting to see. I think that can happen in the next few years. So that's AR driven combined with volumetric. Now, it, the big thing about AR is everybody's frustrated with the need to hold on to a phone, right? Uh, and holding some type of device. So everyone's waiting for the launch of what's the easy wearable version of this so that it, it's not so complicated. And we've seen headway made by, you know, certainly Oculus um, on, on the VR side of making some really significant gains, but also, uh, Enreal is another one that uh, I, we're paying close attention to how that headset and headgear that is AR uh, will continue evolving. And much like every other tech company, I think we're very interested in if the rumors come true this time that in 
the first quarter of 2022, Apple will actually launch their AR glasses. Uh, many companies are beginning to bank on that one uh, based off of a lot of uh, inquiries and uh, desire to create proof of concepts uh, so that they can be ready for when that uh, ease of access um, becomes pervasive. Um, when it's easy for everybody to kind of have an AR experience, then uh, we're going to see this truly explode across uh, across the board. And it'll be every possible and every imaginable use case. Right. So, well, first of all, thank you so much for your time and uh, for this conversation. My last question is, how does one try your software? Do you do we go to the, to the website? Is there like maybe a trial that you're providing or an indie license? And, you know, if, if I'm an enthusiast, I want to work with this. So how do I start? Sure. Uh, absolutely. Come to our website. Um, uh, we will be launching a new website within the next month or so. Uh, so whenever this video comes out, perhaps uh, the new, the new site will already be there. And, uh, Yes, contact us through that website. There are evaluation copies available. Um, and uh, in addition to you know straight up licensing either per month or annual, depending on you know how you'd like to approach the work that you're doing. Well, thank you so much. We'll add the links in the description. So if you're interested, go ahead and click it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. Thanks for enjoying another episode of the 80 Level Roundtable podcast. Check out upcoming episodes on the 80 Level website at 80.lv. Join our career site at 80.lv slash RFP. And share our podcast with friends and on your social networks.